Hello, I'm Reverend Scott Whipperman, pastor here at First Presbyterian Church in Helena, Montana, and we welcome you to our worship service today. I'd like you to know that regardless of who you are or where you are in your journey of faith, you're welcome here at First Presbyterian Church. The epistle reading today comes from the book of Acts, from chapter 9. This is a story that you've heard before, it's always a great one, about Paul on the road to Damascus. And remember that before Paul was Paul, Paul was Saul. Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priests and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heavens flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. And Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand to Damascus, and for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias, Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him and restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands upon Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. The Word of the Lord. So you're walking along and you come to a fork in the road. Robert Frost would have you take the way less traveled. But what? What if in this fork on the road there was a sign? And along one way the sign said, Danger violence possible. And along the other way, the sign said, safe. I suspect that all else being equal, we would choose the safe route to follow. But again, what if we come to this fork and these signs, one saying dangerous and one saying safe, but standing there at the fork is God. And God is pointing us down the dangerous, 
down the risky path. Do we follow? Do we take that risky fork? Ananias was just going about his business one day. And then he has this vision. This vision of God telling him to go to Saul. Because Saul is waiting for someone that he has seen in a vision to come and heal his sight. And Ananias carries on a little discussion with God. And, and he, he reminds God, just in case God might have forgotten, that this Saul guy is someone who has been imprisoning and putting to death people of the way. People that look exactly like Ananias. And is this really what you want me to do? And God comes back with go. And if you look in the Greek, that go is an imperative go. A go with an exclamation point at the end of it. And he tells Ananias that go and be with this man. Lay your hands upon him and heal him. Because I have chosen this very unlikely person to be my messenger, to bring my message to the Gentiles and to the kings and to the people of Israel. So Ananias goes, possibly with great trepidation, and he lays his hands upon Saul, and he prays that Christ may heal him and that the Holy Spirit may come and fill Saul. And immediately, Saul restores his sight. And he gets up and he goes into the synagogues and begins preaching that Christ is the Son of God. Now the Apostle Thomas, Thomas is only mentioned as one of the twelve disciples in the first three Gospels. But in John, Thomas gets Oh, he's a leading character in at least four episodes in the Gospel of John. The one that, unfortunately, he's remembered the most for is the Doubting Thomas episode of questioning whether Christ was resurrected or not and saying that I must see the marks in his hands and put my hand in the wounds on his side. But a week before this, the disciples with Jesus we're all east of the Jordan River, up in the area called Perea. That's a little bit north and mainly east of Judea. They were there. And Jesus tells the disciples that he's going to go back to Judea, go back to Jerusalem. And the disciples tried to dissuade him from this because they remind Jesus that just the last trip there, which happened to be a chapter before, they tried to stone him to death when he was there. And I'm sure Jesus listened to their concern and their care for him and their, their care for his safety. But he told them, no, I'm going. And here is where Thomas stands up. And Thomas says, well, then let's all go and die with Christ. Now, this isn't Thomas being a defeatist. Um, this isn't some statement along those lines. I think this is Thomas showing his love for Christ and his courage to walk with Christ into this dangerous path, into this road. He's willing to take a step in that direction. So Ananias, Jesus, and Thomas they all are ready to follow the path that's labeled dangerous, that, Christ is, that God is pointing to. So say again, you come to this fork in the road with the paths labeled dangerous and safe. And God is standing there pointing down the dangerous path. Again, do you take that route? Do you follow?
Now, I don't know if God told this guy to follow this risky path. If God told this guy to take a motorcycle and jump over a collapsed bridge while a locomotive is coming at you on a motorcycle that Evil Knievel wouldn't even attempt to jump over some Tonka trucks with. But, I don't know, maybe he did. Maybe he showed up to this guy in a vision and said, do this. Or maybe he just put it in this guy's head that this was a good thing to do. So how might God point to us to go down one path or another? And I'll ask you to actually enumerate the ways in which you think God may speak to you, may show you, may incline you to go some way. And then once you've made this list, I'll ask you to remember that God may choose one of those ways or may choose something that you've never thought of to direct you. Now, I'll trust that if I see you typing on your smartphone through the rest of the service, that you're busy working on this list I asked you to make here. <laughs> so it'll, it'll be okay. But uh, there's a man, Mr. Duffield. He's on the board of a nonprofit organization that deals with affordable housing. And they had lots of stuff that had been donated to them that they used in these projects. But the free warehouse they had well, someone came along and was willing to pay for it, so the owner said, I can't lend it to you anymore or let you have it anymore for free. And they found another place, another warehouse where they could go, but they had to move all this stuff from one warehouse to the next. And this all happened with very short notice. And so rounding up volunteers to move all the shelving and all the appliances and all the building supplies and the sod and the seed and even the kitchen sink was challenging. And somehow, county inmates got signed up to help in this move. And they came and they worked in the move. Of course, guards came along with them. To make but no one knew anything about these inmates, other than they were county inmates and they were probably approaching the end of their sentences. They came and they worked side by side with the volunteers and with the guards and did all the moving. And if you were there, would you have talked to the inmates? Would you have talked to them more than just, hey, put that over here? Would you have sat down and maybe over a break or lunch, had a conversation with the inmates. Would you have spoken with them? Joe Kay. Joe Kay was at the airport waiting to board his flight. And a group of men show up. There are men from Afghanistan, and they're dressed in the traditional garb from Afghanistan. And they have two English guides with them. And the English guides explain that these were engineers from Afghanistan, and they were here on a professional tour going around talking to various companies in the United States. And Joe had an empty seat next to him there in the waiting area, and he signaled for one of the Afghans to come sit next to him. And most of them spoke little, if any, English. And he carried on a, oh, polite and um, smart conversation with this gentleman. It was a superficial one, but due to the language barrier there. And Joe asked this man about, did he have a family? And he said, yes, I have a big one. And then he added that his wife and two of his children had been killed in a bomb blast on the street back in Afghan, Afghanistan. And then the man turned to Joe and asked if he had a family, and he said, yes, I have two teenagers. And the Afghan's face lit up and said, teenagers. They were now speaking the international language. <laughs> he understood exactly what was going on here. 
And when it came time to board, they got up, and the Afghan man shook Joe's hand warmly and repeatedly and wished him a safe travel. And as they were going on their way to the plane, Joe thought, we need more of these conversations. We need more opportunity to have the blessed opportunity to spend some time with someone halfway around the world. Why are we afraid of these conversations? Why are we afraid of doing this? So in the wake of another heinous terrorist attack that happened in Brussels a little while ago, it certainly can make us see that or feel that the world is less certain, is less secure than it used to be. Innocent people's lives were taken, and things seem a little more unstable, maybe. Violence that used to be so far away seems to be crouching step by step a little bit closer to our door. Another gentleman who traveled often to the Middle East for five years, he's traveled there for business, and he acknowledged that now getting on one of these international flights, making this conscious decision to step into a place that might be a little more dangerous, might be very dangerous, was a harder and harder decision to make. He has a family, and the family has been getting bigger over these five years. And so making this choice to step into danger is tough. And he recalls the conversations from coffee shops up to the political halls after this last terrorist attack. He recalls these conversations with people saying that we need to do whatever we can to make things safe and to make things secure. Now Johnny has been traveling to the Middle East. He knows about these dangers. And he said that when he heard these current discussions from a lot of the political candidates about what we must do, it struck a chord in him. And he felt like he needed to stand up and applaud. But before he did, another thought entered his mind that held his applause. And he thought, as someone who belongs to the kingdom and who's one of that kingdom always walked into danger, who didn't avoid it, who didn't head the other direction. What am I to do? And he recognizes that this applause of security at any cost is something that he thinks he needs to turn away from, something that he needs to go a different way. Because he realizes that maybe in pursuing security at any cost, we are entering into idol worship. We're worshiping the idol of safety. And as good and as wholesome as something like safety seems, yes, we can make it into an idol. And like any other idol, an idol is something that stands between us and our relationship with God. He recognized that the object, object of terrorism is to instill fear. And that politicians will be glad to take that fear and fan it and use it to promote whatever agenda that they are pursuing. And that this fear can push us towards this idol worship. Towards this something interfering with our relationship with God. Johnny said he realized that there was a real danger here, but he felt that he had to put it in proportion. Because our real danger is far more from car wrecks or chronic disease or accidents like falling off a ladder 
or any other number of things. Johnny said that when we celebrate the death of others because it makes us safer, are we in danger of walking up to that idol of safety and worshiping it? So why are we so, diff so afraid of talking to someone different from us? Someone like an inmate or from Afghanistan or of a different religion or of a different socioeconomic strata or any number of other differences, ideology, heaven forbid, someone from that party. Um, why are we so afraid? Why do we not do this? Are we afraid that in the act of getting close to somebody else that's different than us, we may find out that they look a lot like us? And heaven forbid, we look a lot like them in all the ways that really matter. And that would this turn our world, our self-righteous world, our world where we are the right ones, upside down, to find out that we look just like all these other people? Maybe these people who we feel are inferior to us in some way. Is this what we're afraid of? You might remember that after his death and his resurrection, Jesus went to find the disciples. And where were they? They were in a room behind a locked door. And as you might recall from the story, Jesus walks right through that door. Think there's any symbolism in that statement? And he walks in amongst the disciples and he tells them, do not be afraid. So you have to leave this place and go out and meet them, talk to them, serve them, take care of them, meet their needs and love them unconditionally. Even if it means you get hurt in the process. And in the process, you and they are going to be changed. Grace and salvation and transformation will take place right there inside of you and inside of them. Christ's disciples needed to hear this. They were in shock from his death. And they were still in the wonderment and awe of his resurrection, but they were trying to put together in their head and understand this thing. And Jesus comes in and tells them this. Oh, but by the way, Jesus wasn't just talking to the disciples. Jesus is talking to you and to I, saying, oh, you have to leave this place and go out and meet them, those people that we might be afraid of talking to for some reason. Go out and meet them. Talk to them, serve them, care for them, meet their needs, love them unconditionally, even if it means you get hurt in the process. And in the process, you and they are going to be changed. Grace and salvation and transformation will take place right there inside of you and them. You may notice that Jesus never calls us to be safe. Jesus calls us to be faithful. If you look through the New Testament, through the four Gospels in the New Testament, Jesus never once talks about self-protection. Never once mentions about self-preservation. But he does say a few other things. He does say that we should pick up our cross 
and follow him. Does he say that we should die, die to ourselves? Yes. Does he say that we should die for our brother? Yes. Does he say that we should love our enemies? Yes. Does he say that we may be insulted and persecuted in his name? Yes. Does he say anything about self-preservation? No. So how could Ananias be sure that when he went and talked to Saul, even though God has assured Ananias that Saul has changed, how could Ananias be sure that Saul wouldn't change back? That Saul wouldn't change his mind and go back to his murderous ways? He had to trust God's words and step out in faith. And so it is with us. So will we be divinely vulnerable? Will we take that road that says dangerous and risky if God points that way? And I think it's our role to do so. When God calls to us to be Ananias or to be Thomas for someone here and now, it's our role to go out there and do that. It's our role to share boldly how our vision of the world is that might change their vision of this world. We have to be willing to take risks on people who are deemed to be poor risks. We have to pray for others to do the same for us. Because we may seem like poor risks to some other people. And who knows, this person we're taking the risk for just may turn out to be the next Saul. Who knows, the person taking a risk with us may transform us into being the next Saul. So, we're at that fork in the road. One way says risky, one way says safe. And God is standing there pointing down the road that says risky, that says dangerous. He's pointing down that path which is a little more unkempt and not as well made and is a little scarier and scratchier. Two roads diverged in the wood, and sorry I could not travel both. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. I took the one God was pointing down. And that has made all of the difference. Amen.